alkyl halides will now be discussed. Now, alkyl halides or haloalkanes are widely found in nature. Several thousand organohalides are found in algae and various marine organisms. Chloromethane is released in large amounts by oceanic kelp and by forest fires and volcanoes. Alkyl halides have a very varied usage. Some of them are used as solvents, anesthetics, refrigerants, pesticides. Some examples are indicated here. Trichloroethylene, where you have the chloros together with the with ethene bond there, that's used as a solvent. Here we have halogens on ethane, that is used as an anesthetic. Uh, difluoro, di, uh, dichloro, difluoromethane, well known by all of us as a refrigerant, the things that we don't want in the atmosphere. Bromomethane, uh, fumigant. So there we have a few uses of the alkyl halides. Now for our study, we are going to have a look just at the naming of the alkyl halides and how they can be prepared and the few reactions that will be involved. Naming alkyl halides, we name them, although we refer to them as alkyl halide, we name them according to the IUPAC me uh, method. You will name them as haloalkanes. The Haloalkane indicate to you the halogens, the chloro, bromo, iodo, fluoro. If you have those group seven elements from the periodic table, we are con uh, referring to these ones as substituents. Therefore, when we write our IUPAC name, they will be written in the front before you have your parent chain. So they will be written here as prefixes like all our other substituents. So always remember when we are dealing with the halogens, you don't think of them differently from your methyl group or the ethyl group or whatever other alkyl group. It's just uh, we, we, we consider them as uh, substituents just like our alkyl groups that we have. Now let's have a look at the way we will name these compounds. Say for example we have the following chain. Um, And you want to name this one. First of all, like we did before, try to find your longest continuous carbon chain. Then, once you have that longest continuous carbon chain, decide that will be your parent. Even if there is something like a double bond, remember what we said before, you have to choose that longest chain in such a way that if there's a double or a triple or functional groups like that, you have to choose it so that that double is part of it. So here uh, the same thing happened. You choose your longest continuous chain. Then look at your substituents you have. And you are not going to give priority to anyone here. You are not going to say, okay, because I see I have a halogen now, this one must have a smaller number. The, elk, the methyl group is not going to be that important. That is not going to be the case. You see them exactly in the same light. So you look at them as if they are both just substituents. If I then start numbering here, one, two, three, my bromo is on number three. If I start here, one, two, my methyl is on number two. That is giving me a 
smaller number for my first substituent. So we still make use of the same rules. So here you are going to have your carbon number one, carbon number two, three, four, five, six. If we then write the name, first state your substituents. We have a bromo and we have a methyl. When you write the name, the substituents will be indicated alphabetically. So we are going to start with a bromo and indicate it's there on number four. So four bromo, use hyphens to separate. On number two, we have our methyl. That's your substituents. And then one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have the parent chain, hexane. So the only thing that happened when we have that halogen, it's going to be one of our substituents together with other alkyl groups like methyl, ethyl, propyl, etc. We can have a look at a few more examples there. If you pay attention to what you see in the notes that we are making use of. Here we have a straight chain that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If I start from that side, my first substituent is on number 2. If I start from this side, 1, 2, 3. It's on number three, so it's better to start that side. So I don't even consider whether it's a halogen or whether it's an alkyl group. As long as you have a substituent, you just think of it in that way. So we are going to start then numbering from here. And then when we write the name, you have bromo, methyl, methyl. The bromo, because of the B, it's in alphabetical order. It will be before the methyl groups. So when we write it, we say on number two, we have a bromo group. On number four, on number five, you have a methyl and a methyl, dimethyl, and then the heptane. That is following because of the seven carbons in the parent chain. Of, um, if we take the next one, again, you have your straight chain there. I have, uh, if I number, one, two, my first substituent is on number two. If I start from here, one, two, three, first substituent is on number three. Although that one is the halogen, this one is the, uh, the alkyl group, it will not make any difference to me and you. We still consider just the first substituent. So because this methyl is on number two and the bromo is on number three, it's better to start this side. Then I have all my substituents there. Again, when I write the name, alphabetical order. Bromo before methyl. Bromo is on number five. Five, bromo. On number two, on number four, I have two methyls, two, four, dimethyl. Parent chain is seven and there's only single bond, heptane. Let's have a look at the example we have here. On the very first carbon, you have a Cl, a chloro group. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six. That will be our longest continuous chain. Obviously here, your first substituent is on carb carbon number one, that chloro group. Careful, if you have it like this, don't start numbering the Cl. Start from the carbon. That Cl is only a substituent, so don't let that now confuse you there. Now, after you number them, we have to write them down. Chlo chloro, bromo, which of them is first in the alphabetical order? The bromo. So although the chloro is number one, don't let that confuse you again. You are going to say bromo is first in alphabetical order, and bromo is found on number three. So what's the name for our compound? On number three, we have bromo. Then on number one, we have chloro. 
methyl, M, it's uh, after the C in the alphabetical order, and that is on number four. So on number four, we have a methyl. All substituents stated, followed by the parent, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, hexane. If we take this uh, last example, they indicate here, we have our straight chain, six again. If I start from this side, one, two. First substituent is on number two. If I start from the, uh, the right hand side, one, two. First substituent is on number two. What do I do now? Exactly the same. I have on number two, on number two. Now I am allowed to pay attention to alphabetical order because it's exactly the same number. So here we are going to say because bromo is before methyl in alphabetical order, it's better to start this side. So that's why you see there I have my number one, two, three, four, five, six. When I write the name, alphabetical order again. So on number two, I have the bromo. On number five, the methyl. And my parent is six, hexane. So don't think now if you look at something like that one there. I have methyl here and I have bromo uh, there on number three. Now I must make sure that the bromo has the smallest number because it's first in alphabetical order. Don't ever do that. Alphabetical order will never play a role unless you have a situation where that you have exactly the same position. So there's no difference here other than the alphabet that is the, the, the difference there. So then you can make use of that. Our rules still will be start, make sure you have the smallest number, first substituent. Then smallest number, second substituent. And in that way, you continue further. We also have here some common name compounds that you can just look at. It's just interesting to see what they do here. This CH3I, in the IOPAC systematic way, we will say, I have my halogen. Substituent, ido. Parent, methane, ido methane. And look, it's one word, just like we always do it with the IOPAC names. Common way will be as an alkyl halide. So now you state the alkyl group, methyl, iodide. And can you see now it's separated? It's written as two words. It indicates to you that this one, no longer IOPAC. This is a common name that we are using there. Take the next one. If I do IOPAC, there is my longest continuous chain, and I consider the BR as a substituent. Where do I find it? On number two, two bromopropane. If we make use of our uh, common way of naming, the group we have here, the alcohol group we have here, is an isopropyl. And onto that, we have a bromide, isopropyl bromide separated by a space again. So that indicates we have a common name. So you can see every time when you have the systematic IOPAC, it will be named as haloalkane. In other words, the halogen is not the parent. It's only the substituent. You can really try some exercises. See if you can name them according to IOPAC. Common names will not be necessary for us. We must be able to do the, the IOPAC names, the systematic way of naming. Have a look now at the preparation of the alkyl halides. The alkyl halides can be prepared by making use of alkanes and halogens and let them react in the presence of light. A reaction that you will remember from school. If I take an example, methane, and we let it react with chlorine, and we have CH3Cl, what happened here? One of the hydrogens on the methane had been replaced, substituted by a CL. 
So the other H that is now substituted will be uh, bonded onto the remaining Cl and there we have our products. The reaction we see there, it cannot occur unless we add extra energy in the form of light can now be ultraviolet light, that's usually what we will use, sunlight, ne? ultraviolet light with a high frequency. Or you can use heat, but heat you will have to really heat to a high temperature before it will give the same amount of energy. So light is going to be a, a better way to go. Now the reaction taking place here is taking place via a free radical mechanism and that is why we are going to have a closer look at this not because this is a very important way of preparing our alkyl halides we usually prefer not to do the preparation by making use of this method so when we include it here we do it because we want to to do it as an example of a free radical mechanism so that you uh, see how the free radical mechanisms take place. Now whenever we have a free radical reaction taking place you will see there are three important steps involved. First of all we have our initiation step we have our propagation step And last of all, we have our termination step. Now, what is the meaning of these? Initiation, the word indicate to you, this is done to start the reaction, to initiate it, to start it. Propagation, then it's already started, so it can continue. So in propagation, it's continuing. And termination is going to stop it. Now, when we have a closer look, first, let's start with that initiation step. We are making use of chlorine gas. In other words, chlorine atoms bonded together by a covalent bond. Ne? That's the Cl2 that we start with. And then, by this light energy that we shine upon our mixture, by which we irradiate it, this is indicating to you the light energy. You see there, the way we ca calculate the energy of the light, near the photons. You have your Planck's constant H. You have the frequency of the light, and that is indicating that we are making use here of light energy. Now, by irradiating it then, you are going to have a homolytic splitting of the bond between the chlorine atoms there. Homolytic, you can see I make use of my fish hook arrow there, indicating in this pair of electrons, only one electron will go to the one Cl, the other electron to the other Cl. So it is the bond breaking is taking place place in such a way that we end up with two fragments and each of them is having one odd electron. These ones we refer to as our radicals. You will remember we already defined them before. A radical is a particle that is having this odd electron and uh, very very reactive particles that we have here the reason for that being they do not have a complete octet yet so they want to react in order to complete the octet so you can imagine by doing this homolytic bond breaking we now created two very reactive particles in there so that is then the initiation, the reaction is now starting and we can continue to the propagation step. Let's have a closer look at that. Propagation. So propagation cannot occur unless you have the 
radicals formed. In the propagation step, the methane can now react with the chloride radical. Before we have a look at writing the reaction, I think it will be good just to indicate to you what happened in here. We are going to have our methane. For you, it will really not be necessary every time unless the question states that you have to show the homolytic bond breaking or the homogenic bond formation. But otherwise, you are not going to do it as much in detail as we are going to look at it now. If you look here, you have your radical and you have your methane. And then you have another homolytic bond breaking because of that reactive radical you have there. So we find here a homolytic breaking, the one electron going to the CH3, the other electron going with the H, these two, so the H will now have an odd electron, the Cl has its odd electron, and the two of them now come together, and here you are going to have homogenic bond formation that's giving us the HCl. And on this side, you are going to have your CH3, but there will now be an odd electron present. So this indicates to you the, the process, the real inside reactions taking place when we have this propagation step in our free radical mechanism. Now we are not really going to do it that much in detail here. Let us just say from there we now know that we are going to have the CH3 radical and the H coming from there will give us the HCl with the Cl radical. That radical can now react with another chlorine molecule. And the same thing can happen all over again. You are going to have the homolytic bond breaking here so that you end with a chloro radical and the other radic uh, Cl radical react with that CH3 radical so that you have chloromethane formed as product. Very important when you have a look at propagation you can see there every time in propagation you still have a radical among your products. So you, d you, you do not have a s totally stable products. Now this is one way. I find that the easiest way to indicate the propagation step, but we also find other methods by which it can be indicated. For example, they can do it by writing the CH4 and the Cl and indicate to us these two in the first step they react together. What is the stable product formed? HCl and the new radical CH3. Now that is your product. In the second step this radical can now react with another chlorine molecule so that in the second step we have the uh, CH3Cl product and the Cl radical form. Then again, Cl radical can react with methane, giving us HCl CH3 radical. CH3 radical react with the chlorine, giving us the Cl radical CH3. So you can see here what they do. There in the middle they indicate the radicals. There is our stable reactant, our stable product. Again, a, a, a product and a reactant that you have there. So this is, it's basically what we see here.
but just indicated in a different way. Have a look at all the different ways in which they can do it so that in future, if you have such a method indicated, you will uh, understand what they try to say there. There's a third one that we can have a look at where we put our radicals in the middle. You have your chloro coming now from the initiation step and then in the reaction here we have another radical formed, the CH3. Those in the middle we indicate our very reactive particles and then we say what are the things reacting with these radicals? Methane react with this Cl radical what is formed as my stable product, HCl. And if I, uh, with the Cl and the H, I have HCl, what is remaining there? That CH3 you have there. Then that CH3 you have there can react with another Cl2 molecule. What happened? That Cl react with the CH3 and you have CH3 Cl as product. The Cl remaining will be radical again. Then that can react with another methane. So you see this indicate to you my process occur on and on and on as long as I have radicals. So have a look again. You have that one way to indicate propagation or you have this way to indicate propagation or we can use this way. So there are three ways. Have a look at them, decide which one you find best but for you then take that one that you find easiest. Finally we have our termination step. In the termination step we find that the radicals come together and they produce stable products. So you have the homogenic bond formation. The CLCL bond, you have Cl2. The CH3 radical meet the Cl radical and you have CH3 Cl. Or the CH3 radical meet the CH3 radical and it gives us CH3, CH3 ethane. Of course you may write it C2H6 because that is what you have there. So here there's no specific order. The only thing we, we write here when you have to, to write down the termination step just think a bit. What are the radicals we have? We have CL radicals we have CH3 radicals and all of these can now possibly meet. So make sure that you state all the possibilities. CL can meet CL, CL can meet CH3 or CH3 can meet CH3 and that's where your different reactions come from. And have a look in the products, no radical, no radical, no radical. That's why the reaction will be terminated. So in the propagation you still have a radical every time you are going to have a radical. Propagation, your product is containing a, a radical. That's why the reaction can continue further. Termination, no more radicals. That's why the reaction cannot continue further. Now this method is then an example of a free radical reaction. So make sure that you know it for that reason. We do not really make use of this method to prepare our uh, haloalkanes, our alkyl halides. The reason, if you look here, look at your products. You are going to have chlorine formed as product. You are going to have chloromethane as product. You are going to have ethane as product. That's not all. You can imagine, and this part you need not to, to indicate to, to us, but just have a look here. Remember you have that one now and you have the chlorine radicals present. So we can have another Cl replacing one of the other H's so that you get dichloromethane. 
The dichloromethane in turn can react with another so that we have tri chloromethane and in that way we can continue so you can imagine it's not only these products that you see there you can even have this as product you can even have this because these things are all together in one container so imagine in the end we do not have just one specific product and you have to still separate them and that is going to be uh, difficult it will take it will cost us money ne? and it will not really give us a pure product so in the laboratory the preparation of the haloalkanes of the alkyl halides occur usually by making use of substitution reactions by starting with alcohols now we did one in the laboratory you will remember where we started with this alcohol in the common way you can see there we are having the third butyl see the four carbons ne? tertiary carbon that you have there the third butyl alcohol uh, that is not the IUPAC name. Uh, we know that. Ne? You are having the, the uh, if I say third butyl alcohol, I, I have the common name to, wait, to, to name it here. Now, if I take this uh, two methyl propan 2, all that we have here, IUPAC name, I can treat it, you will remember, with excess hydrochloric acid, and the result will then be. A substitution of the OH group on the alcohol by the Cl and in there you have your haloalkane formed uh, your haloalkane prepared which is now a pure one so you have exactly one specific product and that's why we prefer these methods to do the preparation but again here there's something to keep in mind if we look at our alcohols, we find that there's a difference whether you are having an alcohol like methanol with a CH3 group or if you have primary alcohols, secondary alcohols, tertiary alcohols, we need to have a look at their uh, reactivity. As long as you have the methyl, in other words, methanol itself, ne? it's the least reactive uh, with a, uh, uh, in the substitution reactions. Then the primary is less reactive than the secondary and the most reactive ones will be this tertiary one. Now, as the one we have here, the one that we did, it was a tertiary alcohol why do I say so let's quickly have a look again our OH for the alcohol is bonded to the carbon we see here and if we look at that carbon we see it's bonded to one two three other carbons so it's alcohol groups everywhere and if you have a situation like that we say we have a tertiary alcohol now the tertiary alcohol can react very easily with the mineral acids like hydrochloric acid to have the chloroalkane or hydrobromic acid to have the bromoalkane so with with a tertiary alcohol this will happen very easily because they are quite reactive in this method if i have a primary or a secondary totally different story what is going to happen there? That tertiary alcohol, when it's reacting, it is reacting via what we call, and this I just mentioned, you are not going to do this already now. This is in the next course of the organic that we are going to have a look at this. But this is taking place via an SN1 mechanism. 
Now the SN1 is forming an intermediate and in that intermediate you have a carbocation formed. Now this carbocation we have here is a tertiary carbocation and you will remember when we they, when we dealt with the uh, carbocations we said carbocations the primary carbocation is the least stable secondary is a little bit more stable tertiary is the most stable so because when we are having the tertiary alcohol and it changed into a tertiary carbocation, the transition is not so much different in energy. You need not to have such a high increase of energy. Whereas for the primary and the secondary uh, carbocations, they are very unstable. So we change now from, for these, we change from a stable primary alcohol or a stable secondary alcohol into a very, very unstable carbocation and that will not happen. Now these ones will occur in a different way. So the reaction you have there is an SN2 mechanism. Now please, for now, you are not really going to, to, to pay attention further to that. As I say, this will be discussed in a, the next course. Uh, then we are going to have a look at those. So for me and you, just remember, if you have a primary alcohol or a secondary alcohol, and we want to have the alkyl halide formed, we cannot make use of hydrochloric acid or hydrobromic acid. You have to use a stronger nucleophilic uh, substance there. And what we use then is thionochloride to prepare for us the chloroalkane or phosphorus tribromide to prepare for us the bromoalkane. So tertiary alcohols can be done with hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, but when we have to deal with the primary secondary alcohols, we have to use a stronger reagent and that will be then the thionyl chloride and the phosphorus tribromide or phosphorus trichloride. Ne, phosphorus chlorides or thionyl chloride. They are stronger nucleophilic reagents and that's why we prefer then to use them. At this stage, we don't look at the mechanism. It will be done then with us in the next course. Uh, that is now everything on the preparation of the alkyl halides. Thank you.